Good morning, brothers and sisters and young people in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this, this morning's readings uh, have potential to be uh, very negative as a negation, but I will uh, use the other coin, side of the coin. They will strive to make it uh, positive. Because in Jeremiah 16, God was extremely upset with his people. And in Matthew 27, God has given them, given them hope through his son. So in Matthew 27, our resurrected Lord reminded us of the work which is still to be done. Work, work which can only be accomplished by knowledge, understanding, and obedience. We can all have some knowledge, understanding, but unless it is lived in obedience of what we know and understand, we do not have a whole lot of value or God will probably not have a whole lot of value for it. And there are many parables that point to that fact. In Matthew's, Matthew chapters 25 to 28, Jesus knew his time was coming. His time was at hand. And he knew that he did not have much time left. So Jesus was taking every opportunity to speak about the events which were about to occur and which were taking him to what he was called to do. So over and over again, in the last days, he would talk very seriously and straightforwardly to his apostles and disciples. So much so that some of them, the, the disciples, uh, said, this is too hard for us to understand and to, to accept. So, and they left. And Jesus asked his, his apostles, uh, are you going to leave me too? And they said that there was no one else he could go to who had hope that he was providing. <clears throat> so Jesus was taking every opportunity to speak to them, and he was showing them that God had a purpose for him, and that this was his time. And everything he was about to do was for his father's glory and his father's honor. So if we understand our role concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to mimic that. Our lives have to be a glory unto him and an honor unto him as his was on to his father. So once again, we come together to praise our heavenly father and to recommend re, and to be reminded of the road Jesus paid, paved for us. We come to remember and to partake of our purpose. How would the world know of Jesus' purpose? We are Jesus' purpose, aren't we? Because of him, we can reflect his name, his glory, and his Father's name and glory. We have come to partake of that purpose. We are Jesus' purpose as Jesus was God's, and God's glory. Jesus said, for this purpose was I born. John 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Brothers and sisters, we have to, have to echo these words. For this cause were we born through the waters of baptism, 
For this cause came we into this world, that we should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth, hear it my voice, said the Lord. So for this purpose were we born of a woman, born of water, born of spirit. From the very beginning we have been called. Because we were told in Colossians 1 that Jesus, even before the creation, was in God's mind, in God's purpose. He did it. He created it for him that he may be what he became. Because he will be what God wanted him to be shortly. So we have come to remember him through the bread and the wine, the broken body and the poured out blood. We have come to meditate on whether our walk matches our talk. In 1 Corinthians 11, we are, we are specifically commanded to meditate on our lives. We all remember Brother Bob Lloyd's uh, famous saying. He used to say, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, it's a duck. So brothers and sisters, is that us? It has to be us. Because Jesus lived this life, lived this life like that. Everything he said, everything he did was for his father and the purpose that he had been called for. That too is our calling. For many years when reading the portion of the gospel that we which described our Lord's betrayal, his judgment, his crucifixion, and death. For many years, I felt very angry towards those who did it. However, the more I listened to Jesus' actions, the more I listened to Jesus' life, how more purposeful his behavior became to me when he saw what was about to happen to him and started to understand that my part should be to accept that everything that happened to Jesus was already played out in God's plan. So why should I be upset? In fact, it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. He gave me life. He gave us life. And because of that, Jesus knew that God's plan, God's purpose was being fulfilled. Thus, it did not make it easier for him, because we all know when we are faced with very difficult times, how stressful it can be. I had a situation this week where uh, I got bumped a bit with uh, another car, and I got pretty upset. I got upset. So I have his address and everything. So you know what, what I will be doing this week? I will go and apologize. Because I have to reflect. The God's character and Jesus purpose, why he lived and why he died. No matter who thought otherwise, Jesus, or tried to change it, Jesus never stopped his walk. Jesus said to Peter when he tried to stop him from going to Jerusalem, get ye behind me, Satan, he said. There was nothing that would stop him from living his purpose. And that's how we need to look at it. The more I listen to Jesus through his actions of those last weeks of his life, the last days, the last hours of his life, the more I realize that my role, like Peter's role, at the same time is to listen to what God and what Jesus want from me. And what 
and what that work has to be and how much harder I have to work to obey and to live my life according to their will. Not my will, Jesus said when he was talking to his father, but yours, your will be done. So Jesus' role was to obey. One of the greatest aspects of his role and one of the greatest challenges. Because we know that Jesus' calling was to be undoing what Adam had done. He had to obey. He had to undo this disobedience that had occurred. So easy it is to disobey. Because we are so entrenched in our own purpose, our own control, our own plans. It becomes extremely difficult sometimes to let go. But Jesus said, I have come to do thy will, O God. Brothers and sisters, are we accomplishing the same for our Lord? Have I come to do his will? Clearly, my role, my purpose is to listen to God speak through Jesus' life. Jesus lived as God created man in Genesis 1.26. He lived in the image and likeness of the Lord God and his angels. No matter how much energy we spend on trying to control things in our lives, we will all end at the same place. The only control we have to take a hold of is self-control. I had a discussion with uh, one of the uh, one of the, the uh, service people at the uh, when I had my truck serviced, and uh, I got that from him. He said, "You know," he said, "That's." So true, because we were talking about giving up control. And he said, the toughest one is self-control. Jesus gave up control of his life in order to obey the commandments. He gave it all up for his God. And through that, by giving up, he gained. He gained life. The parable of the talents. When Jesus passes judgment on the one talent servant, the servant clearly understood the expectations of Jesus. And Jesus clearly expresses the fact that the expectations had been clear. Both parties were very clear on what was expected. It is also clear that the expectations were not a request. They were a command which required absolute obedience in order to be accomplished. Whether it was the five talents who made 10, the two who doubled it, the one who could have been two, the one who could have been one plus a bit, but the one, the zero, gained nothing for his Lord. He said, I understand. So much so that I am afraid of it. Jesus said, well, if you were afraid of it, well, you should have done it. Take away what you have, and I'll give it to the others. Jesus lived his life according to the scriptures, which spoke of the type of life he had to give. The scriptures are clear about us, about the type of life we need to give. When tested by the spirit in the wilderness, he only used fasting and prayer to gain the strength and courage he required to keep sin from opening the door. In Genesis 4, 7, God said to Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee is desire. If we let the world in, the world will be our master. What was Jesus' weapon for overpowering and destroying the flesh? We talked about it. We made reference to it earlier. 
He had to give up control of his life and give it to God. Using God's words, God's purpose, God's power, God's strength to lead his life, not his own. We cannot win by ourselves. Secondly, seeking God's help and guidance through prayer. Constantly, Jesus was praying. All night, Jesus was praying. Thirdly, turning knowledge into action. What we do know has to become our point of life. Has to become part of it. Fourthly, living the expectations of God. As we reviewed the, par the parable of the talents. That was the expectation. The servant knew the expectations. But unlike Jesus in the wilderness, he did not follow it. All parables Jesus used clearly explain, explained God's expectations. The only reason they were questioned was because the hearers, those who were being spoken to, had issues with the lessons intended. They took it personally. They took it against them and could not change. They had to give up the control of their lives to God's will and purpose. They could not do it because their lives were very good in their own eyes. Basically, they were saying, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And we're seeing that more and more today, isn't it, in this situation of what's happening in the world. People have let go. The next phase is beginning. Three days ago, half a million new cases in one day, half a million. We're pushing the 16 million. Another year and a half, two years, they say potentially could keep on going. Bottom line, Jesus gave control. I was having a discussion with a neighbor yesterday afternoon and we were talking about this. And I mentioned to her the, uh, the verse that I just used, unless he drink me there for the moment we die. And she, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's the younger people that they have let go. They are wanting to live, but it will cause problems. So what is our role as sons of God? In Galatians 2.20, Paul wrote, I am crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved and gave himself for me. Paul was living the command Jesus gave him. That is why our respect and honor is due to our Lord. When we approach him, we have to be extremely honorable to him, even reverential fear. The first talent servant should have had that and he found out that he should have had that and he should have listened. Who, if asked to visit a queen or a president or a prime minister or even a president of a company, would not ask what's expected first. And they would bow if they had to. They would say the right thing. They would be very nervous, extremely nervous to be in their presence. When we approach our Lord and even God, what kind of mindset do we have? Is it just, oh, it's church stuff. It's, uh, it's Jesus. I know Jesus. Have we become too familiar? 
When we come to remember, let us do so in humility, giving all control to him, because we heard what his expectations are of us. We know what they are. Matthew 27, we see how Jesus lived for his God. We see his life. So many of the words he spoke during his ministry coming alive and giving life at that time. Remember in John 12, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, said Jesus, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abided alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Acts 8.32, the place of the scripture which we read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb before his shearer, he opened not his mouth. John 19, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. John 17, 4, we read, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do when he was praying to his father. Brothers and sisters, we need to be saying the same to our Lord. We need to be meditating on those words and see if indeed we are. And he, in Matthew 27, verses 52 to 54, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints that's, which slept arose and came out of the grave after his resurrection. So what would have happened? Many, many graves would have been opened, but the bodies would have stayed. They did not come out of the grave until Jesus was resurrected. And they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Can you imagine the commotion? That's coming again, isn't it? And on verse 54, just an, a, a thought, and when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. Is this Cornelius? The graves were opened. Will this be the sign, brothers and sisters? Will this be the sign for us? Breaking news. Radio blares. Internet fully loaded. Graves by the hundreds of thousands have been opened, which appear for no reason as the bodies are still in them. Can you imagine hearing that on the news? Then when Jesus returns on the cloud, however, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the cities and appeared unto many, they will come out of the graves by the hundreds of thousands and millions Jesus said, the whole world will know. Can you imagine that happening? The news, the television, the radios, the internet. Facebook will be busy. The whole world will know, said Jesus. Then it will take some time to go through the process of judgment assigning the cities, teaching the roles of the saints, the foreshadow of this event is Joshua and the nation of Israel across the Jordan, waiting to enter the promised land, giving time for the people to prepare to fight this great people, for they know it's a great people because they heard the signs 
they heard what God had done. If what we just talked about is the way that it's going to happen, there will be a lot of hype. The world will know that this is a special thing happening in the Middle East, a special people, and there will be great fear and thus great resolve to prepare for the battle against this enemy, which appears to be incredibly strong, incredibly magical in the superstitious world. There have been very strange happenings occurring, they will know, throughout the world because of these people, of what's happened. We know, said Rahab to the spies, we know that God is God and he is with you, just as God had said would happen. God said the world would know that I am God. Even after 40 years, they knew it was still fresh in their minds as to what he had done to Egypt. All our nations are shaking in their boots, said Rahab, because of you. Jesus and his people, but they will fight you as they have worked so hard to gain what they have. They will not give it up easily. Rahab knew and Rahab took action to protect herself and her family. For 40 years, Rahab had been planning this, had been, I am sure, keeping track of where the Israelites were at, at any one time. Brothers and sisters and young people, we know what we know of the signs of the times. It is obvious. We know it is time to lift up our heads. The time is short. We need to get our faith aligned with our knowledge and watch because our redemption indeed draws nigh. What is about to happen has been talked about, foreshadowed, echoed, typed in every book of the word of God for 6,000 years. It's not new news, but it's history for most people. It's no news for most people. Like a woman with child knows when her time is near, we know that the time for another birth in God's plan and purpose is getting close. We can feel the pangs of pain. We have been given the information. In Matthew 28 verse one, as it began to dawn the first day of the week, which would have been early on the third day, early on the third millennium is the foreshadow after Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection and ascension. We are at the beginning of the 7,000 year. We know in Genesis chapters one and two, God said, early on the seventh day from creation, God's day of rest is about to begin. This is what's about to take place. Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he had done, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth. So God had finished his plan with man. He saw that. He knew that. God had Jesus in mind. God saw Jesus. God knew Jesus. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, all of the nations were in place, all of the powers on earth were in place. Those are the hosts. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all work which he had made. We are there, brothers and sisters and young people. Let us look and watch. Verse three, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. 
Jesus will start his reign. He will start the Sabbath day, providing a rest for his Father, his God. As promised by God, Jesus will save his people. Jesus will bring the enemy to submission, and they will become subject of the new laws established by a righteous king whose representatives will manage throughout the earth as promised in the parable of the talents. They will have their cities. They will be educating. They will be going forward. But first, the Canaanites will be fighting him. But this is a topic to be addressed by our brother Jonathan Bowen every evening next week during the virtual Manitoba Bible camp. His topic, training to be kings and priests. I will not address it today because I will not want to take anything away from an extremely powerful week that I know is coming. Matthew 28, verse 10, Jesus said, Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Lord willing, we will get the word soon, brothers and sisters, to go where he is, and there we shall see him. Brothers and sisters and young people, we all live for that time. That's our calling. That shall be our single most important purpose every morning when we wake up. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him. That is our time. That will be our time. It is here. It is coming. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That is true, isn't it? It is coming. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That is what Jesus was talking about. It's the now. It's the soon to be. Everything that happened in the past is futuristic. Today we are here to remember the future. What Jesus did for us was not then, it was for now. Today, we are here to remember what he did for us. When we can see him and worship him. Hope is not historical. Hope is not in the past. Hope is looking forward. If we have hope in him, he didn't do it for yesterday, he did it for tomorrow. At their last Passover meal, Jesus' last recorded words at the meal were of hope. Matthew 26, verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Even then, he wasn't talking about what was going to happen next, in, next or tomorrow. It was for 2,000 years from them. Everything that he did was for God's plan and purpose. Brothers and sisters, this is what we yearn for. This is what our remembrance is about. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, young people, we need to listen to his life, to our Lord's life. And we need to lift up our heads and watch and strive to realign ourselves, redirect our thoughts, our path, our purpose. May God bless your walk. And we pray that he will be here today. Amen.